Hi, everybody. My name is Sarah Garthley from Rossomly Healthy Pets. I am a holistic care specialist for you and your pet. And through CBD oil, nutrition training with raw feeding, and holistic nutrition supplements as a representative for the paw tree. And today I am talking to Patty Sontag uh, about nose work. And I don't know much about nose work, so I am going to be learning just as much as you are. So I wanted to thank you, Patty, for joining me and telling us all about this amazing sport that I know you have done quite well at. So I am going to hand this over to you. And so tell us a little bit about yourself and your bio and all that good stuff. Okay. Well, um, as I stated, my name is Patty Sontag and I live in Massachusetts with my two Kerry Blue Terriers, Lexi and Catcher. Um, Lexi is nine years old and Catcher is four and a half. I do a variety of dog sports with them, uh, which includes obedience and rally and of course nose work. So they do have titles in all of those sports. Um, I got started in the sport in January of 2010 when it first came out to our area. And um, I fell in love with the sport right away. It was just something that really intrigued me. Um, I guess I'm sort of a science geek of sorts. And um, the way that it all came together, I found quite interesting. Um, it was also fun to do something different with my dogs where they were sort of driving the bus, so to speak. And I was along for a ride as opposed to telling them what to do and then they would do it. Um, in nose work, you don't do that. They, um, you can't tell them where the odor is um, because you wouldn't know in a trial. So um, we really have to rely on them and um, watch them carefully. So um, as time progressed, uh, I continued with the sport. Um, I trialed my dog. Well, I had Lexi at the time. I didn't have Catcher. And um, at one point, our nose work instructor went out on a medical leave. So my friend and I stepped in to cover her classes. Um, I fell in love. I got bitten with the bug about teaching. And, and I said, I'd really like to pursue this a bit further and, and become certified myself. So when the opportunity arose, I became a um, certified nose work instructor through oh, the wow. NACSW. And um, yeah, and it's, it's, it's kind of an extensive training. There's a lot of information that's, that's given out to people and um, tests that have to be taken and, and student evaluations, you know, people that, you know, that you've taught um, have to evaluate you as an instructor. So um it, it's it's kind of daunting and it wasn't anything that I had ever done before. So it was something new, but I was certified in um, 2015 and subsequently our nose work instructor left to start her own business. So um, I took over and I'm now teaching eight classes and we have other two other certified nose work instructors on board as well. Um, Along with that, I have become a part owner in the business, and um, I, I teach at Masterpiece Dog Training in Franklin, and Mass. And can, can, um, they, can they find you on Facebook are, on that? Um, they can. Masterpiece Dog Training does have a Facebook page. And actually, the, I'm listed as a CNWI, which is a Certified Nose Work Instructor, on the National Association of Canine Scent Work, which is NACSW.net. And if you look in Massachusetts, you'll see there are a number of us. Um, we have a very active nose work community um, in the New England states. So um, we are not lacking for students at all. Um, we, most of my classes are full wow. and uh, we are teaching now, I think we have 14 wow. nose work classes. So um, yeah. In addition to all of the other pet classes, agility classes, competition obedience classes, we, we're busy I seven days a week. Say. And where so, is your business located again? It is in Franklin, Mass. Um, 
not too far outside of um, the Boston area, um, probably about 40 minutes or so uh, west Lovely. of Boston. Lovely. So um, yeah. explain how nose work was started, the actual sport. Okay, so back in 2006, there were um, three dog trainers um, that had been training detection dogs, uh, dogs that are trained to detect um, drugs or explosives. And they saw how much the um, dogs enjoyed it. Uh, and they thought that, gee, wouldn't this be fun to do something similar, have something similar for pet dogs? And so they devised a program and they started it out there and it was very well received. And it sort of evolved from there into putting a trial together. And like I said, in 2000, well, in 2009, we read about it in the whole dog journal and we thought, wow, wouldn't this be something fun for our um, pet population to do with their dogs? So we invited somebody to come and become an instructor, be one of our instructors and um, someone who had trained with the three founders who are um, Amy Hero, Jill Marie O'Brien and the late Ron Gaunt. Um, so he came out, this, this person came out and he taught us for a number of months and then it just took off from there. I mean, we, it just exploded. And um, so we, that's how it, that's how it all started wow. back out in the East coast. It just jumped the country nice. and came out here. Nice. So, yeah. um, so how do we start a dog in nose work? Well, um, what we do is, um, we start them out by finding food in a box. And there are several boxes that are out there, usually six or seven boxes. And only one of them has food. The boxes are open and dogs are usually just on a, a collar to start. Um, some of them have harnesses and we do encourage the harness eventually. Um, but they, they just have to go out there and just check out the boxes and without any instruction from the handler whatsoever. When the people come in, uh, we do a, what's called a, a little talk class before the class starts. And we tell them, once you come in here, this is an obedience-free zone. There are no uh-uhs, there are no leave-its, there are no that'll do's. Um, we don't, it's just, again, the dog is at the front of the, the leash, the end of the leash, and they're out there working. And we are there, just there to, watch wow. them to start that's amazing so yeah we use boxes um to start because they are cheap i mean that's that's the easiest way to say it they're cheap and they're plentiful i mean how many of us don't have boxes lying so around you, after the holidays just regular cardboard um, boxes we we use we can use regular cardboard boxes um because we run tests uh, for nose work for something called odor recognition tests, we have a shed full of white cardboard boxes. And we use those because, again, we've got a ton of them that are left over from um, tests. And um, we just, you know, cycle through those. Plus, it's familiar for the dogs when they, if they do decide to go and do a, an odor recognition test. When they walk in, they see the same God. familiar boxes, but it's not required. They can, you can use any box so long as the dog can get in there and access the food. Nice, nice. So what kind of dogs yeah. um, can participate in nose work? Um, I, I like to jokingly say any <laughs> dog with a nose. So... <laughs> Um, truthfully, any dog can do this. Uh, it doesn't matter if they're deaf, uh, blind, um, if they are tripods, um, dogs that are reactive can participate in the sport so long as they're not reactive oh. to humans. Um, but yeah, any, any dog can really participate in the sport. And even if a dog is reactive to humans, it's still something that they can do at right. home with their owners. Um, there's no requirement that any of these dogs go on to compete. Um, it's, it's just, it's a, it's a fun activity for the dogs. 
Uh, and if people choose to go on to compete, great. That's great, too. That's a really interesting point that even the dogs with issues, it doesn't mean they can't do this sport. It just means it's going to be, you know, configured to them and what helps them excel. And just because they can't trial doesn't mean they can't do it at home where, you know, that's a really good point. Glad you brought that up. So how are classes run? Well, our classes are run. Um, the classes last an hour and we don't take more than eight dogs in the class um, because we want to make sure that there are enough opportunities for the dogs to get enough reps, uh -huh. as we call them, in. So typically a, a rep would consist of three turns and then put your dog away. All of the dogs are either crated or worked out of their vehicles. Uh, the reason that we crate is that when we start out with nose work, the intro level, what we want to do is awaken the hunt drive in the dog. Um, so if the dog was in the wild and had to hunt for their dinner, uh, they couldn't hunt successfully and focus on the search if they felt a tiger was going to come up behind them and eat them. So I always make that analogy because I do get that question a lot in the beginning stages of the class. Why do we have to create our dogs? My dog gets along great with other dogs. Um, that's not, you know, it's not an issue for my dog. My dog doesn't like this or whatever, whatever. And that's great, but not all dogs like other mm -hmm. dogs in their faces. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. It's a safety issue. It's also gives the dog a chance that after they've had their turn, they can go back to their safe space and think about mm -hmm. what they just did. So, um, it, it gives them time to process and um, in, in a relatively quiet environment. And then when they come out again, they've, they've thought about it for a little bit and they're a little bit stronger in their search. So when I explain it that way to the, to the handlers, they then understand why we do what That's we do. That's fascinating. Very cool. Mm -hmm. So is it better to have a dog yeah. enrolled in the class or to do private lessons? Um, I think it's better to have the dogs enrolled in a class. Um, one part of nose work, which is really important, is that the handler get to see other dogs working. Uh, you learn a lot by watching other dogs search, not only your own dog. As a matter of fact, you, you learn more by uh -huh. watching other dogs. You don't really see your dog working when you're working your dog. So true. So, um, by, by being in a class, you get to observe that. And again, being in a class, you have that downtime built in so the dog can process and can recover from the search because searching is mentally tiring for dogs, um, not physically tiring at all, but just mentally tiring. And they do need that downtime to recover. You will see, or at least I, I've seen in classes, where if you try to put too many reps into a class, you can actually see the dogs physically uh -huh. getting tired because their brains are tired. So you can see them slowing down. You can see that intensity, that drive isn't quite as sharp as it was at the beginning of class. So you as an instructor need to know when to back off and say, dogs have had enough right now, no more. In a private lesson, you do get that one-on-one -on -one time with the instructor, which is important. And there are times that are good to have private lessons. Like if you're going to do an odor recognition test and, and you need a little, an extra pair of eyes watching you or videoing you or whatever. Um, but it's hard to get that downtime in. And I don't like to do private lessons for more than half an hour if somebody right. has just one dog. It's just right. too much. So um, do you find that, do the dogs learn off of each other when they're in the class environment? And what I guess what I'm asking is when I used to do 
um, was really active in weight pulling with Bean. Um, the energy mm -hmm. when the, the, the pull was going on and the other dogs were getting excited and walking in the chute and pulling and they would come out of the chute going, yeah, the energy of the dogs would be like, get fired up. And they would, they would, you could see them learning off of the other dogs. Do they, does that happen mm -hmm. in nose work? Like when in a class situation, do you see the dogs going, oh, you know, I know it sounds very, very human like that I'm giving them human qualities, yeah. but I did see mm -hmm. it in weight pulling that in a, in, in a class environment, the dogs do somewhat learn by osmosis, I guess you want to call it. Have you, do you see happening at all yeah i i really i really haven't seen that um again because the dogs are all away they don't get oh, to so observe one another in the same room and well they might yeah they might be in the same room but they're all crated um and they're they're spread out the crates are spread out but um well they might be in their vehicles if we're doing a search outside they're all in their oh. own individual vehicles. And so they're not watching at all. So interesting. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I recall you saying that you started using, started out using food. So why aren't dogs started on um, right away on odor? Well, I know that there are some organizations that do start dogs out right on odor. But if you think about it, odor has absolutely no value to a dog. Birch means nothing to a dog. Um, clove means nothing to a dog. It's something that mm -hmm. we would have to train. We find that it is more important to build the hunt drive and to do a lot of problem solving using food because food is intrinsic to dogs. I mean, it's, it's, they need it to survive. And it's very important to them. Uh, the other thing we can use, I, I should also say, is if a dog is more driven to find a particular toy, then we'll use a toy. We can use that as well. Um, most of the time, it does seem that food is what the dogs are searching for. But um, we can set up all kinds of problems for the dogs to solve, whether it's height, um, whether it's barriers, whether it's wind, um, we can use we can use food for all of those types of search scenarios before even introducing odor. Um, if something goes wrong when the dog is being imprinted on odor, and shortly thereafter, if something goes really badly, we've got a mess to clean up then because again. The odor has no value to the dog, so it's what we call poisoned, and then we have to deal with that. So we'd rather work through all the different scenarios um, before introducing odor, and then, you know, it, it's just introducing odor is the simplest thing to do. It's all the other stuff that's hard. Very interesting. So um, mm -hmm. are clickers used for clicker training? No. And, and I'm a clicker trainer. I, I, I have to say I, I'm a clicker trainer. And our facility is a positive reinforcement facility. We do use clickers. Um, that question is also used a lot. Why don't we use clickers? And I come back with my own set of questions. What are you going to click? Are you going to click the dog finding the food or the odor? Uh, food and odor, I'm, I'm using it interchangeably here. But are you going to click the dog finding the hide? Are you going to click the dog's head turn when they go by the box and they notice or they smell something is there? Um, do you, you know, what do you click? We don't know. You know, it's very hard to determine what would be the right point to click. And when you click, what happens? The dog turns around and looks at you. And you're... And we don't want the dog, yeah, we don't want the dog looking at us in, in nose work. We want the dog focused on finding a hide. Point. Excellent. I took mm -hmm. one um, nose work class with Kaber, and I do remember 
um, that, you know, don't pull them off of that to look at you. You don't want mm -hmm. them looking at you. So I do remember that point in the, the brief classes that I took. Um, so you had said the obedience free zone. Um, what does that mean? Um, it just means that the dog is in charge. You basically be quiet and there are no verbal corrections. There are no physical corrections. Um, you don't say, you know, if the dog is sniffing something else that you feel is not important, you don't say, uh-uh, leave it. Um, there's, there's none of that because you don't know where the odor is going. Um, odor travels mm -hmm. in mysterious ways. And, and it, uh, it really does. I mean, if, if, if we could see the odor as it is moving, um, it, it's just, it's astounding how it falls back in on itself and swirls around and, and everything. And what looks like nonchalant sniffing to somebody who is learning about the sport may actually be something that the dog is picking up on and needs to figure out that problem. So we just tell, tell the people to be quiet. And if they, and, and we, that's another thing, being quiet is important because every time we talk, our dogs are so obedient and so tuned into us that it will disrupt their thinking and their hunting. So um, I oftentimes jokingly say when I get someone who is a real chatterbox, don't make me bring out the duct tape. I haven't had to do that I've yet. I found but it a difficult transition for people that come from those sports that talk to their dog a lot, or like you're saying, that chatty woman is – is it I'm sure it's difficult for some people to make that switch and that in and of itself is part of the training is is for the the owner to be quiet it is it's hard to give up that control because those of us who have um competed in obedience or agility or you know any of those other sports where we're directing them sit come stay down um tunnel, weave, you know, all of that. We're right. telling them what to do. Uh, in nose work, you just tell them to find it and then you be quiet and you watch them and you watch for the changes of behavior that they give you because those changes of behavior are forms of communication from the dog. And we need to learn that and we need to be um, hyper aware of it so that, you know, a stutter step, a head glance, um, changes of breathing, um, change of direction, 180 degree change of direction. Dogs don't change direction for no reason. Um, 90 degree change of direction. So all of that is, is really important and something that we need to pay attention to when the dogs are searching. And it takes time because we need to just be observers and it's hard for us to get yes. up that control. Yes. I learned that a lot in the beginning of the barn hunt with Bean. It, it's, but you know, it's, I'm sure just like with barn hunt, it's so fascinating to watch a good nose work dog. It's so fascinating to be part of that team where you're just the bystander and watching your dog do all of these amazing things that, they're bred to do and natural for them. It's right. really amazing. And Bean is walking around here. So I'm sorry for all the nail clickings. Um, Cause I've been <laughs> bad and haven't done her nails recently. Um, so <laughs> well, right. That's okay. My guys are sleeping. So there's right? <laughs> relative quiet here. <laughs> um, I know. I Anyway. Um, so I know you, briefly went into this earlier but um and what sort of equipment i mean other than the boxes is there other sort of equipment you need to train for nose work the only thing you really need to get started is um or what we call either a greyhound collar which is a really wide collar or 
a back clip harness. Um, a back clip harness versus a front clip harness. Again, there's that obedience coming in here. Um, back clip harness is, we want them pulling. Um, so we want them dragging us into the search area. We want them dragging us over to a particular area. Front clip harnesses don't allow that. They come back to you. So we say no, no on that. But a regular harness, uh, back clip, uh, greyhound collar, um, usually a six foot leash is enough to get them started. And as they progress, handlers usually want to go to a 10 foot line, a 10 foot long line, um, sometimes even longer, depending on the dog, the speed of the dog, um, size of the dog, where you're going to be searching. Those of us that do nose work, we have lines of varying lengths and textures and you know right. we all have our favorites so um it just it's you know comes and goes but really the only thing you need is what i use is a harness and a line and, and it's really it. um i wanted to go so. back to your comment about you wanted them pulling and obviously you know doing the the weight pulling that was you know something i encouraged in being and is like yes pulling and a lot of and, you know, mm -hmm. obedience trainers will see it and it's obviously a negative to have the dog pulling, you know, and I'll be sitting there going, well, mm -hmm. you know, you could harness that and have them, you know, they could excel at nose work. They could excel at, you know, weight pulling. They could excel. At, there's for whatever behavior that a dog is expressing, there is a sport out there that you can <laughs> channel it instead of making the pulling a negative. Get involved in some of these sports that encourage it. And, you know, it's, that's a sure. really interesting point that it's, um, there's so much out there for dogs to do with their, their handlers that, that accentuate mm -hmm. any behavior. Um, very right. interesting point. Good point. Um, right. There are a number of obedience people who do do nose work. Um, my obedience instructor is doing nose work with all three of her dogs. Um, I mean, she's an obedience judge and, um, she, you know, we, we all do it, but because we have the equipment change, our dogs know when it's okay and to that, pull and when it's not okay to pull. That is another great point. It's like, once you put on that harness, mm -hmm. that means that's their job they're doing. It's okay to pull exactly. and it's okay to do this and it's okay to do that. Very, yes, that's very accurate. Um, so you don't see an issue with the obedience dogs um, learning nose work and just getting out of that controlled obedience structure. Do, you know, once they know that harness. Right. Yeah, I don't see I don't see a problem with it at all because I mean I'm still competing with my dogs in obedience and rally. Um, as a matter of fact, I want to get my dogs back into the AKC arena. Um, I've been doing CDSP obedience recently, but um, yeah, they 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 don't see a difference. They they know the different equipment, so I have no problem with I don't, that. And, I don't um, mean problem as I mean, in Lexi, a negative is a problem as in, do they have trouble switching it on and off once that's what I was kind of a problem. It's like, once they learn that harness, there is no, I mean, they know, how, they, like I said, they know when to turn it on and off kind of thing. When it's an obedience leash, they, they know to be obedient and this is the job to do. And when they mm -hmm. see a, um, when they have the harness on, they know that's the job to do. Much like um, that Correct. myth, or and I'm sure still a lot of a belief that you can't do um, obedience while you're doing confirmation shows. It's like, no, you use a different right. collar. They'll know mm -hmm. the difference kind of thing. So, um, Sure. Right. Um, so describe the progression of a six-week intro class. Okay. So we start off with... Um, the food in the box and it's on the floor and then as they come back the next week it would be food in a box on the floor but now we would introduce height and we would do that by putting some of the boxes on chairs 
And what we want to do is to encourage the dogs to put their paws up on the chairs, if they're little dogs, obviously, put their paws up on the chairs or raise their head off the ground to find the food. Um, not the, the food isn't always going to be, or the hide isn't always going to be on the ground. It can be at the NW1 level, it can be up to four feet high. So we want to have them up and down, catching the odor molecules that might be in the environment. And the best way to do that is to work with them and let them know that it's okay to get their head up too. Um, from there, we would, this would all be mm. on leash, by the way, um, because we're working with dogs that we don't necessarily know. And we want to get a feel for how they work, how their handlers work. Um, and it gives us some sort of a base to work with. By week three, we're cutting them loose where they're off leash. And that's hard for the handlers too, because they're giving up that control. They don't have that leash attached to them. Um, but we put other things in the environment, things that maybe people have brought from home, tote bags or um, some kind of bins or watering cans or anything that would have a different smell to it than what I would necessarily have at the training center. From there, we go on and we introduce barriers um, by means of ring gates and stuff like that. Um, and the dogs have to learn to problem solve. And if the box with the food is on one side of the barrier, they have to figure out how to get around oh. to get to the box. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's fun. It's a lot of fun. And then um, after that, we introduce wind. So we explain the different types of wind, upwind, downwind, crosswind to the handlers. The dogs don't need to know that. They, they, they already have that down. We're right. the ones that are right. kind of behind the curve here. Um, and we explain how the wind affects the hide and odor cones. Um, these are all technical terms, but it, you know, how the dog can work in and out of a, an odor cone to catch the odor molecules to work it back to the source of the odor. So, um, that's basically, and then the sixth week is just sort of like a, what we call a junkyard search. We throw everything out there, barriers, wind. Um, chairs, you name it. it, it's all out there. And the dogs, and it's all off leash, and the dogs do wow. a phenomenal job. After that initial six weeks, then we go into what is called our venues class. And what we do is we take what the dogs have learned in the intro class, and we sort of take it on the road, so to speak. So we might have them searching out in the office area. Again, starting with boxes, because now boxes have become very uh -huh. familiar to them. And, and they know when they walk in and they see all the boxes there, oh, I know what we're doing, we're doing nose work. We're playing the sniffy game, whatever right. you want to call it. Um, so we do interior searches. We might put them in bathrooms um, or in a maybe put them in the other ring. I mean, just a change of right. scenery, so to speak. We also take them outside and we do exterior searches, which now we're dealing with a lot of other environmental factors because you've got other smells out there, you know, wild animals, um, you know, the restaurant down the street that might be cooking lunch and, you know, pizza or whatever. Um, all of these other smells have to come into play and you've got the variability of the wind. We can manufacture wind inside the building by use of a fan, but outside right. we have no control over that. So we, um, that's also a good, a good experience for the dogs to encounter. Uh, the other thing we do is uh, vehicle searches. Now we don't search inside the vehicles. We only search the outside and by this class, we have them using what's called the hide a key boxes. You know, what we used to use like years ago to hide keys outside the, the house. Um, and we can put them on the cars, wherever there's metal. We can put them on the cars. A lot of cars don't have metal on them. It's very, it makes it challenging. But um, we have them searching the exterior part of the vehicle. And we keep the hides low 
because in a trial, um, people offer up their vehicles as um, for vehicles for vehicle searches, and nobody wants to get their car back full right. of scratches. Yeah, that, right. Yeah. So what we do is we work with the dogs. We keep the hides low. We build their expectation that the hides will be low, and that will help to alleviate that problem. So that's that's our venues class, and that's another six week class. Two weeks outside, two weeks inside, two weeks on vehicles. Wow. After after that, we then the last segment is intro to odor, and that's where we imprint the odor on the dogs by pairing the odor with the food. So as the dog is eating the treat in the bowl, they're inhaling the odor. And it's making that association in their mind. This smell brings food. Nice. The odors that are used real quickly. Um, okay. Just, just let's go over that again real quickly. Sure. So um, the three odors that are used in NACSW trials, National Association of Canine Scent Work, are birch, anise, and clove. Now, only birch is used at the lower levels. So that would be an NW1 trial or an element level one trial. Um, anise is the next odor that is used, and that's used along with birch at an NW2 trial or a level two trial, a level two element trial. And all three odors can be used at an NW3 trial or an elite trial or, you know, anything beyond that. So, um, Oh, I didn't. So I thought that, yeah, that, used at the, at the base level. I did not know that. Yep. So nope. well, I was it's one odor at a time. Yeah. Um, and that, that does make sense. Um, just on a learning purpose, that makes sense. Um, so back when I did, now we're going back a couple of years when I did a class mm -hmm. with Caber, um, this concern was, was, you know, I heard about this concern a lot and I'm sure this concern is brought up to you a lot. Um, but the wellness of the dog breathing in these odors constantly and, you know, the toxicity level and all of that, um, like I said, I'm sure you've gotten this concern a lot. So can you speak to that? Sure. So this was um, an issue that was raised probably about five or so years ago on the internet uh, that people were concerned or that there was someone that had done quote unquote a study on this and um, they felt it could be a problem. Um, and I think that more or less they were concerned about the birch and the connection to xylitol, um, that did not appear to pan out. And in fact, the way that we sent the Q-tips and not only we as instructors, but trial officials, um, the way that they're sent it, they, they do not directly put the oil on the Q-tips. Um, That's important the, to note, yes. Yeah, the Q-tips are absorbing the odor molecules uh, from the vapor and the essential oil is basically evaporated. So we use very little um, oil to scent our Q-tips and we use them over, we don't, we don't scent them. You know, maybe I refresh my Q-tips, oh, I don't know, five or six months, they go without being refreshed. Oh, wow. Um, or yeah, because they do hold the scent. And when I start to see a diminished response from the dogs, then I will either refresh them or use a new batch. Wow. Um, but they basically, we don't, we don't scent the Q-tips themselves. They're basically absorbing the odor. So it's kind of the, the difference between diffusing an essential oil and applying it directly to the skin. There's a, a right. vast, it's vastly different to how it is. absorbs it. Um, so that's a great point that you brought up that it, the oil is not physically on the Q-tip. Um, Correct. 
So explain why the bare Q-tips and why they aren't used in practice. Um, the bare Q-tips can, there can be some residual odor left on them. So when we handle the Q-tips, we do not directly handle them. We use tweezers and we put them in a vessel, um, a tin, a straw, a shrink wrap tube, um, something that is going to hold the Q-tip and not let it come directly in contact with the environment. Um, we also don't touch it for that very same reason. Uh, finish uh, loading our tins, then we have to place them somewhere. And if we have any of that, those molecules in our hand and we touch anything in the environment, we're contaminating the environment. So we are very careful about handling the Q-tips. Um, not to say that they're... Um, dangerous that it's not that we don't want to contaminate the environment right, right. so we treat it as hot as almost like a hazardous material very we're very similar, very careful with very it. very similar like if you're watching an obedience trial very similar when they're using their scent items that the um the um oh, i'm losing it but the assistant um in the 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 trial will go up and use their clipboard to pick it up or use a spatula or, you know, it's very similar. So it's not that you're, it's not that it's dangerous is that your body scent can't contaminate the item. And uh, yeah. So I understand. exactly. Yeah. Yep. Um, sacred, the trial, you know, what, you know what I meant, right? The trial. Um, yeah. The articles and, and the steward. Steward. Who, that's it. Thank yes. You, you don't want the steward picking up, the article that you've just sent it by putting their hands on the bar right. that you've just sent it. So I, yeah, exactly. Yep. So um, what, um, what are the prerequisites a dog must obtain before a trial? Well, before they can enter a trial, they have to pass what's called an odor recognition test for whatever level they are going to trial at. Um, also that's called an ORT for short. Mm -hmm. So, if they want to enter an NW1 trial, nose work one trial, they have to have passed a Birch ORT. Um, same for NW2, they have to pass a Bananas ORT and uh, Clove for NW3. A lot of times people will say people Um, we do tend to introduce all three odors in the same six-week session. And when we are conducting our classes, we will interchange the odors. So we don't always use birch. Sometimes we might use birch and clove. Sometimes we might just use anise. It, it depends. When I first started in the sport, that was not an option. Um, I did an ORT with my previous dog, Duffy, and only Birch was offered. And we only had trained on Birch. We never, ever got to um, work with Anise or Clove. So now we do things a little differently. We do introduce all three odors, and we interchange them back and forth. And, and people... It doesn't matter to the dogs. It matters to the people, especially early on. They'll say, well, what odor did you just use? What, what odor is the dog looking for? Yeah, I don't know. I just put it out there. You know, I, whatever. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Um, but we don't want to use one odor so heavily that it becomes super important to the dog right. to the detriment of one of, or two of the others. So we, we switch them up. Nice. Nice. So they have to, they do have to pass the odor recognition test before they can enter a trial. Okay. And so speaking of that, um, the levels of the, the nose work trials, um, speak to that. Okay. So your first level would be an NW1 trial. 
And in that trial, your dog would be searching all four venues, which would include containers, which are basically white cardboard boxes, um, a vehicle. Well, there'd be one of three vehicles that would have odor on it, uh, up to three vehicles, uh, an exterior area, and one interior room. And you would know going in that in each of those venues, there is only one hide. So you find the hide, you call the alert, you have to say alert, that's, that's the key word, you have to say alert, you can't say here it is, um, it's very specific. So you call the alert, time stops, judge says yes, off you go. And you pass all four in the same day, you get your NW1 title. Nice. And once you've done that, then you can go on to NW2, which is basically the same thing, except you're using two odors. But now you have to search two rooms. And it can be up to three hides. So it's one to three. But you'll know how many going in right. that there are. Um, same with containers. You can have more than one hide there, too. So, again, you know, it's, it's, you know going in how many there are. You get into NW3, and now it is a mind game for the handler because you don't know how many hides there are. They don't tell you. Oh. Yeah. And so you can have – oh, I should mention also at NW2, in the containers, there can be distractors. So there can be food distractors or toy distractors intentionally put in some of the containers. Right. Um, you know, maybe a blueberry muffin, um, <laughs> a tennis ball. Yeah, really, tennis ball. Uh, and you don't know where the distractors are. So your dog has to be solid on finding the odor and not that really stinky brand new tennis ball that just came out of the container, or the little tennis ball container. Um, so that's, that's one difference that is at NW2. Now at NW3, yeah, you can have distractors there, too. You just don't know how many hides there are. And you are searching three rooms now, one of which could possibly not have any odor in it at all. And you can search up to five vehicles. And then you have your exterior area, too. So the fact of not knowing is really um stressful for the handler yeah 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 and you don't know until the end of the day so when you leave a search area if you've got what they say no no's then there's a possibility you might have found all you might have found all the hides but you don't know no no's means that you didn't false alert that means that your dog didn't indicate on something that wasn't a hide, okay? So, um, or fringed, you know, didn't, didn't quite get to where the odor was. Maybe, you know, if there was a pooling of the odor somewhere else in the room and the dog indicated on that, when in fact there is no odor there, then you get a no and then you know, well, I just paid $130, $140 for the privilege of training. <laughs> so... You know, that's kind of what that is. Um, but if you pass all four venues, then you get your NW3 title. Wow. Once you pass your NW3, three times, you get your NW3 elite. And then you go into elite level trials. And those are a blast. <laughs> those, are, those are just amazing. Um, the areas, the search areas are typically much larger um you can have containers within an exterior area basically anything goes anything you can have you can have an exterior area with vehicles in it um everything is in play wow so and you may have up to five or six minutes to search a really large area so you have to really move and um Again, sometimes you don't know how many hides there are. There can be eight. You don't know. You have no idea. Or they might give you a range. Say, 
three to seven. So you go with what you can find and, you know, but if you call a false alert at the elite level, you can continue on searching. You can call two false alerts and continue searching. Oh. If you call the third one, you, that's it. You're, you're done. You can't go any further. But at least you can call false alerts and keep on going. So it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, it's, it's, I really enjoy training or trialing at that level with Lexi. Um, she has her elite level two, and we have points towards our elite level three. Nice. So um, it's based on a point system. So, and you can go all the way up to championship, which you need a thousand points to get your championship. So, are there champions out there now? Uh, there are no champion carries out there yet. Ooh. Yeah, I know. I, I know. I see someone shooting for that. Oh, you know it. <laughs> you know there, it. But it's, it, you know. Are there breeds out there, there that have champions? Yeah. No. Yeah, there are. There are. There are. Um, I, I know, personally, I know I know some people that do have their uh, championships, um, you know, different different dogs. I know there's a lab. There's several that I know that do have their championships. So it is a big deal. Uh, it is a big I, deal. Yes. I. Yeah. That, yeah. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. So is there any, are there any titles after Elite? Um, well, there's the, the, the elite level titles and the championship. And then after, once a dog reaches the championship level, um, they really can't, well, they don't, they don't compete. They go into what's called a summit trial. And those trials typically last, they run over two days. So oh. it's a, a whole weekend. Um, I think my, one of my earbuds is dying out here. Um, but I'll keep going. Um, so they basically, it's a two day trial and they just, they just amass points and then they can get summit trials, summit titles too. So I haven't personally seen any of those yet. I think we've had one in the area and I was not available to volunteer at that. So um, I know there's another one coming, but it's also going to conflict with an NW3 and elite trial. So I think I'm going to go for the trial instead of volunteering. <laughs> All right, cool. So if I don't get in, right. I, I'll volunteer. Right. I'll do that. So speaking of getting in and everything, how does someone enter a trial? Um, all entries are done online. The entry period is usually, it, it is a 48-hour window. So um, say from noon today until noon, 48 hours later. And you do it online, as I said, it goes out to California. The entry is done, everything goes out to California. And once the entry period closes, then they do a random draw. I don't know how they do it, I've never seen it, so, but it must be something to do with a computer. And um, they come up with however many slots there are for that particular trial, and each level has a certain amount of slots. So NW1 obviously would have more dogs able to be accommodated than an NW3 trial. Right. Um, those, that information is sent back to the trial host who notifies the people that they get in and everybody else is on the wait list. So we've had wait lists of over a hundred dogs wow. trying to get. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. If you're number 95, you have a pretty good chance of not getting in even number 50. You're not going to get anywhere. So you can go plan something else for that weekend. Right. Right. Yeah. That's similar. Um, I don't do agility, but that sounds similar to um, how agility entries work and everything. Um, right. Yeah. Or at least how it was. Yeah. 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 So where are the trials held? Um, the trials are held in all kinds of different locations. Um, lots of campgrounds, um, schools, colleges, um, Baseball parks. I, I catcher got his NW one at a uh, minor league baseball park in New Jersey. I think it was. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, it was really pretty cool. And we actually had one up here at a, at a minor league baseball um, stadium too. Um, uh, that wasn't 
apparently that wasn't my level of trial or I did get in or something or I was volunteering or whatever. But then there was an elite level trial at another baseball stadium in, in Nashua, New Hampshire that we did trial in. Um, so basically anywhere, sometimes businesses, I've been at a business down in New Jersey or Pennsylvania, right on the border anyways, um, a few years back where they had a trial there. Um, so basically they can hold trials anywhere, but not dog training facilities. They will not hold dog training, um, any trials at dog training facilities, uh, because there are too many dog smells there. Right. And, um, um we, what kind of space do they need? Cause you mentioned a business. So what kind of space do they need to do these kind of trials? Um, typically it's, it's kind of a larger area and what they want to be sure of when they're, um, and the NACSW has to approve the trial site. Mm -hmm. Um, but they have to be aware of the flow, the traffic flow for dogs and handlers to get to and from search areas and also lines of sight so that competitors who are awaiting their turn in the parking lot don't see the search areas and then people going to another search area don't see a particular search area so it it gets tricky and um the trial hosts really have to do a lot of research into this take videos and everything send it to the nacsw and they will take a look at it and either approve it or ask for more information or whatever wow right yeah so um who sets the highs at a trial? Well, um, I've been, well, a lot of people think the judges set it, and they don't. It's the certifying official that sets the highs. And they have been trained by the NACSW in how to set highs. Um, oh, they have to take in. Yeah, they have to take into account, you know, the um, odor flow and, you know, temperature variations and, and how things, how everything can affect the odor. Does it rise? Does it fall? Um, That's amazing. Yeah, wind flow. There's, there's a lot to it. And you don't just, you know, throw the hides out there and, you know, see what happens. Um, they're placed very thoughtfully by the certifying official. And... Um, and the judges are there to just judge to see if the dog actually did find the hide or showed some kind of change of behavior so that the dog recognized that there was odor there um, and then did locate the hide. The judges are primarily um, retired police officers, oh. uh, retired military uh, people who have handled dogs, both of have handled detection dogs, um, people who have done search and rescue with dogs. Um, so they've had a lot of um, training. Okay. I did not. I hope my phone. Yeah. So it's, there's, there's quite a bit wow. that's involved in that. And so the judges just judge. That's what they do. And the certifying official is the one that sets the heights. So how much before the trial starts do, does, are the hides set? Do they like set them like enough time that the odor is really there or? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, usually the trial committee will get there um, an hour and a half, at least before the competitors get there. And once the competitors get there, then there's a briefing, there's a walkthrough of these um, search areas so usually the first dog isn't on the line until probably could be as late as 9.45 or 10 o'clock. Wow. So, wow. yeah, they've, they, it's had enough time to, um, as they say, cook. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now I know going back to what dogs can participate and everything. Um, mm -hmm. Now, I've heard that, you know, the rescue dogs, do they have their own little title or, or um, class that they enter or anything like that? 
Well, they compete with the rest of the dogs, mm -hmm. but um, the one thing, and I want to make sure that I read this correctly, they have something that's um, an award that's special only to rescue dogs. Oh. And it, yeah, and it's only given to dogs at the NW1 level, and it's called the Harry Award. Um, it's given to the most outstanding rescue dog that demonstrates extraordinary ability and spirit in nose work. Um, and a rescue dog can be defined as, you know, anything, but it's not a dog that's, that's purchased from a breeder or anything. It's usually um, a shelter dog or um, rescued from the street or fostered with a rescue or an organi rescue organization or something like that. Oh, that's fabulous. And it was, it's named the Harry Award because Harry was a Beauceron who was one of the earliest nose work dogs um, in California who showed tremendous enthusiasm and promise. And days before the first nose work trial was going to be held there in August of 2008, he was out hiking with his owner in um, the California hills and they came across a snake. Uh, I'm not sure the snake, I, I don't want to say rattlesnake because I'm not positive it was a rattlesnake, but it was a, it was a venomous snake. Oh no. And he intervened and he took the snake bite for his owner. Oh. Um, sadly, several days later, the dog succumbed to the effects of the bite. Mm. So this award is given in his memory. Oh. Um, at every NW1 trial and it's a tremendous honor and there's never a dry eye in the house. I even get teared up even thinking about it. Uh -huh. um, but it, it, it's, it's even the presenters tear up. I mean, I've even seen when the founders present this, they, they tear up as well because I think they probably knew Harry. We didn't know Harry, but um, it, is, it is such a tremendous testament to the love that the dogs have for us. Oh my God. You know, that, that it's just, it's just, you know, it's very touching. So, so, mm -hmm. um, so let's getting back to the, the trials and everything. So what are some of the challenges that are encountered at each level? Well, at the NW1 level, um, I think the biggest challenge that people have to deal with would be, um, nerves, stress. Oh, yeah. You know, a lot of times the people who get involved in nose work, are, again, are pet dog owners, and they've never done anything competitive with their dogs. So this is a big deal for them. Um, and, and, you know, they're out in a strange place and, and they're being judged by, by this professional dog handler. And it's scary. Um, I think that's, that's the biggest challenge at NW1 is just keeping your wits about you and as they say trust in your dog you know having enough training time in to be able to put your trust in your dog that your dog yeah. will call the alert properly um the NW2 of course the challenge there is would be the um distractors in the container uh search yeah. because Sneak. people get really Oh, yeah. People get freaked out about that. They really get worked up. And um, so that's that's a concern right there. It's not so much. You, again, you know how many hides there are. So, you know, going in, you just have to cover the search area. Um, in W3, again, it's it's a mind game with the handler because you don't know how many hides there are. So you really are putting all of your faith and trust in your dog that they're going to be able to find everything that's there and not find something that isn't there. Right. You know, because too many of us have called, you know, there's been three hides and we've called, you know, all the others a fourth hide. So, um, you know, we always find all the hides plus one. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's the challenge right there. And then elite is just, you know, you're working against the clock because there are so many hides out there. The areas are so large and, Five or six minutes goes by in a flash. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. And then I'm sure so, like that, that pressure of time 
as like you're saying the you know the the watching the clock and everything it goes so fast but then you know that it goes fast so then you're like oh, oh. okay i'm getting goosebumps just like yeah that kind of pressure my god sure my goodness um so i might be bouncing back and forth um because i okay. miss dogs in white what does that mean okay so the dog the dog in white is not necessarily a white dog. Um, a dog in white is what basically it's a test dog to make sure that there's enough odor available uh, so that the dogs that will be trialing can actually detect it. Oh. Um, so it's, it's, they, it's, a, it's, obviously, it's I, I guess it's sort of obviously an experienced nose work dog, right? It is, but you're, you wouldn't pull an elite dog in to do, to be an NW1 dog in white because you would expect that that dog would have many more skills. So you don't go up too high up the level um, oh, really? to get that dog, you know, you want to kind of keep it like apples to apples more or less. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so we've been, we've been dog in white several times and it's been, it's, it's always an honor. It's always exciting um, still is a little bit of pressure, even though you don't have a title on the line, it still is a little bit of pressure because, you know, the judges are there watching, the CO is there watching, and you want to do a good job, you know, and you want your dog to do a good job. So the pressure is, there's still some pressure there, but, um, you just want to make sure that there's, there is enough odor available to the dogs. And sometimes they might have to adjust something or whatever, and then call you back in again. So, oh, you know, Thing. yeah. So that's a that's a dog in white, and um, and that dog is is running, um, or being run, um, probably during the briefing in the morning, so that the the hides have had enough time to cook, and there is um, enough odor available to the dog. Wow. Yeah. I know that. Interesting. Yeah. So I know um, we've touched on this a lot throughout the um, our our, inter our interview and chatting, um, but I just want to mm -hmm. recap. Um, and maybe new points will be brought up. So, um, what are some of the benefits to the dog doing nose work? Um, it's it's a good mental workout for the dog um and it allows them to do something that they do quite naturally which is sniff um so and it, it provides an outlet for that and in a good way yes um because we're encouraging them to do it um as far as the handlers go i think it helps us to see the world from the dog's point of view mm. um you know we we don't notice an awful lot about our world and so this really kind of makes us slow down and and take a look at at the environment and really kind of get a picture of what the dog is experiencing through their nose yes so um it, it really gives us a new appreciation for our dog and for our dog's capabilities. Um, so that's, that's one good thing. And, and overall, I just think it deepens the bond would, between the dog uh, and the it, handler. It just transcends. Cause I obviously do other sports um, and just sports in general. I mean, it transcends your bond to a whole different level and you, you learn the nuances of your dog and, and it's just the most amazing thing ever to have that kind of connection with them. It's truly, truly it is remarkable. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so is there anything that I haven't asked that would be, that would be good to let people know about? One thing that um, that I, I didn't mention and, and I should um, is that these trials literally run for all day. 
Um, so you get there at 8.30 in the morning and you might not be done with the awards ceremony until maybe 4.35, 5.30 in the afternoon. Um, it's a long time for the dogs. It's a long time for the handlers um, to be hanging out. Um, that, that type of stamina is built up over time. Yeah. Um, as a way of being able to compete with your dog, um, but not invest a whole day, uh, the NACSW has uh, instituted element trials. So in an element trial, you would be searching for just one element, whether it's containers or whether it's interior rooms or whatever. And there would be three to five search areas set up. Now, typically those searches are smaller in scope so there'd be fewer containers smaller um rooms or or less of a room to search maybe not the whole thing um but along with that with that comes shorter times so you get you know it's it's you know you might not have three minutes you might have one minute right to find a hide right so um but those trials only last a half a day and if you pass all of the searches, three to five, a lot of times it's four because it's easy math. Um, if you pass all of the searches, you get your title and that's it. If you don't, and you, but you pass 75%, if you find 75% of the hides, then you get a leg towards your title. And the next time you trial at that element, in that element, you... Uh, can get your title as long as you pass again 75 percent wonderful awesome yeah so it's a nice way to even get some extra practice in if you're having trouble in containers or exteriors right. or something right yeah interesting yeah mm -hmm. so um remind people how to find your business um on social media or the internet okay so um, I am at masterpiecedog.com, M-A-S-T-E-R-P-E-A-C-E-D-O-G. And we also have a Facebook page. And um, if anyone is looking to get started in nose work, they can check at the NACSW website, which is nacsw.net. There is a list of certified instructors um, by state. Um, they also have, and I was checking this out today, they also have, um, let's just see, okay. They have, air, uh, high, um, sorry, instructors in not only the United States, but in some of the Canadian provinces, as well as Australia, Japan, Germany, and Sweden nice yeah so it's it's becoming global now which is kind of cool that's exciting that's yeah. exciting so does the yeah. um the nacsw do they do they do specific training to be the um i know you said the judges are retired people and everything so the um but the people holding classes do they have to get certified through the organization if if you want to be a certified nose work instructor then um yes you would have to go through the nacsw um because they have they have standards that they want their instructors to meet and um you know it, it's 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 very specific they take them right through the intro levels on up and in addition the nose work instructors have to be recertified every two years. Oh, um, that's yeah, that's nice. Yeah, so you you have to keep up with your CEUs, and you do that by going to um, seminars and workshops, Cont and um, also by volunteering at trials too. Nice, awesome. Um, well, I want to thank you so much for doing this. It has been an amazing, amazing time chatting with you and learning about this. And I'm sure My pleasure. if anybody has any questions, you can comment below 
I will get all of the links from Patty and put them in the description of this video, as well as the link to episode one. Um, but if you have any questions, comment below and Patty can help answer them um, or guide you to where to find that information um, because she is obviously a wealth of knowledge and obviously is very excited about nose work because your face just lit up so much when you were talking about it. So I really appreciate you doing this. And definitely, if you are in the Massachusetts area, remind me again where your business is. We're in Franklin, Massachusetts. Okay. If you're in Franklin, Massachusetts, look, I'm looking at you right there. If you're in Franklin, Massachusetts, there you go. <laughs> yeah, find the little camera. <laughs> if you're in Franklin, Massachusetts, absolutely look for Patty at Mass sure. Dog Training. I think that is the most adorable little name and evokes a lot of good goodness. Um, so I want to thank you for joining us. And again, my name is Sarah Garthley of Rawsomely Healthy Pets helping you raise your pet holistically. I am a holistic care specialist, bringing you high quality CBD oil and nutrition supplements through poultry.